Today, I'm going to talk in this series uh, on different routes of transmission of infection, about sexually transmitted infections, and also those are passed on intravenously or blood, bloodborne infections. And this is part of a series looking at the broadly five routes by which uh, we, infections are passed on between people or occasionally between animals uh, and people. And the route of transmission in all cases is really important because it's key to understanding how the disease behaves and it's also key to understanding how we control it. And the ones I've talked about already are vector-borne diseases, diseases passed on by insects and arachnids, uh, oral uh, diseases passed on by food and drink, uh, and today uh, I'm going to talk about sexual diseases, sexually transmitted in infections, uh, and uh, blood-borne uh, infections. Subsequently talk about respiratory and touch, which are the final ones in the group. Almost all infections have a dominant route by which they are mainly transmitted. Some of them it's exclusive, they only go by that route. Uh, some of them have got a secondary route and that's important uh, for some of the diseases I'll talk about today. Now this is a big contrast in terms of this route of transmission, the sexual route, from the ones I've talked about so far. The previous things I've talked about in this series can be passed on between complete strangers, often at a distance. So, for example, an oral uh, infection could be passed on uh, up the food chain, could be passed on through a watercourse. The vector-borne could be passed on by a mosquito flying uh, from one village to another. In contrast, sexually transmitted infections, STIs, are almost exclusively transmitted by close contact between two people where the infecting person knows the infected person very well uh, and usually is very fond of them, loves them and cares deeply about them or at least desires them. So it's a very different uh, form of transmission. And because this is uh, something which uh, is essential for the survival of the species and uh, it's something which is happening uh, the whole time among uh, adults, several viruses, bacteria and parasites have evolved to take advantage of the strong human desire for intimacy, for love, and for sexual contact. It's potentially, from the infection's point of view, a very efficient transmission strategy. Two people are very close together for prolonged periods, often not taking huge amounts of care because they have other things on their minds. Uh, and it's also often uh, relatively less defended parts of the body immunologically. The skin, for example, very tough, uh, very few things can get through it. I'll come on to that in a later uh, lecture. Uh, the gut, which you talked about, hugely defended by multiple layers of defense, less so uh, for uh, sexually transmitted infections. Uh, and this can happen in all forms of sexual contact, uh, heterosexual, uh, men having sex with men, uh, and women having sex with women. All of these are possible, but different uh, ratios, which I'll come on to. It's often assumed, uh, and wrongly, that STIs are medically trivial, and some of them are. But several of the major diseases of humanity, both now and historically, are transmitted mainly, or exclusively, exclusively via the sexual route. These include, uh, and I'll go into these in greater detail, HIV, which is the last really serious pandemic we had before COVID and has killed over 36 million people to, to date, uh, according to WHO statistics. Syphilis, a major multi-system disease, again caused huge epidemics uh, when it first arrived. Several infections that cause cancer uh, including um, uh, HPV, uh, which causes cervical cancer, hepatitis B. Again, I'll go into those in greater detail. And then many uh, more classical sexually transmitted infections, which can cause significant physical problems, including, including infertility, particularly in women, but uh, in both uh, genders, uh, stillbirth uh, and other um, uh, problems uh, in the course of a pregnancy and neonatal damage. And they can also cause significant stress and relationship damage. 
So these are not trivial infections by any means. Now, because the route of transmission between the two people is so short, because people are basically against one another uh, for a very uh, significant period of time, the ability medically to intervene is very different from other routes of transmission. So if you think about uh, the vector-borne uh, diseases, uh, if you can intervene with the insect that is carrying the disease between one person and the next, you can stop the transmission. If you think about the uh, waterborne diseases, if you can keep uh, feces out of water, if you can have proper sewage uh, disposal, proper uh, clean water, uh, you can, uh, for example, uh, reduce or remove completely the risk of infection. There can be a medical intervention between the infected person uh, and the person who becomes infected subsequently. Uh, for sexually transmitted infections, of course, you can't. The contact is direct and it is personal. So there is much greater reliance medically on finding cases amongst people who are infected early uh, on in their disease and treating them and if they're in a stable partnership uh, or have had recent uh, sexual partners um, with whom we contact traced, uh, treating their contacts at the same time. Now, one of the biggest barriers to being able to do this is embarrassment or shame uh, where someone feels embarrassed about the fact they have a sexually transmitted infection. And this is often the reason people don't seek help or don't seek help early enough. And I think I cannot stress too strongly that for all medical staff, nursing staff and others, diagnosing and treating STIs is common and normal business. These are common diseases. Uh, they're things people get uh, and they're things which can uh, almost in all cases be treated. So stigma is a very major barrier to diagnosing and treating STIs. And recognizing this, there are several different routes by which treatment can, people can seek treatment. Uh, there are obviously people who can go to their GPs and through those kind of routes. There are also uh, separately uh, and entirely confidentially uh, sexually transmitted infection clinics which specialize in this area and keep completely confidential records separate from other ones. So there are various ways people can uh, access care. Medical interventions can also include behavior change, and this uh, is possible, uh, but um, uh, people have to uh, engage with it, and it includes things like using condoms, which I'll come back to. Now, there are some important sexually transmitted infections for which we now have vaccines. But for most of them, the uh, main stay of management is treatment, and that, of course, means you've got to diagnose it before you treat it. So unlike a vaccine, which you just give to everybody, uh, the treatment will only be given to people who are infected. So people have got to be identified. Unsurprisingly, STIs are mainly diseases of sexually active adults. So most infectious diseases, if you think about them, have their biggest impacts in the very young and in the relatively or very old. Uh, and if you think with, about COVID, which the, we're going through at the moment, really heavy uh, burden has fallen on older people because of the higher risk of that age. But for many infections, it's the very young and the very old who are most affected. STIs are, in a sense, the complete opposite of that. They occur, if they do occur, uh, after sexual debut. Uh, and so therefore, they're usually diseases of adults and specifically, they're most commonly acquired uh, early on in people's sexual lives before they have formed their lifelong partnerships. And therefore, they tend to be heavily weighted towards younger adults, this very different age spectrum. It's important to understand, though, that uh, many can be, uh, if untreated, and many people don't know they're carrying them, they can remain infectious for years and, in some cases, for life. So if someone does get infected in young adulthood, they could carry that infection uh, with them for years or decades. And people are often unaware they've got them, uh, have no symptoms themselves, uh, and the first time they realize they've acquired at some point along their sexual life a sexually transmitted infection uh, is uh, when a new sexual partner develops the infection and gets symptoms. And this could be after many years after the last sexual uh, relationship they had. 
uh, but because the disease has stayed there and without symptoms, uh, people just are not aware of the fact they've got it until, as I say, they pass it on. Just to put a little bit of a few numbers on this, uh, this is the rate of new STI diagnosis by gender and age, and there's a very, there is a bit of a difference between uh, the genders. In England in 2019, this is the year uh, before, obviously, COVID started to change uh, the statistics for a variety of reasons. And what you can see is the youngest, uh, 15 to 19, are the bottom bars, and we go right up uh, to people in their uh, 60s at the top. STIs can happen at any stage along the life course, but a really heavy concentration, uh, particularly in people in their early and mid-20s and early 30s. An important part of STIs, particularly to pull out, I think, uh, is the impact on pregnancy uh, and on childbirth. And it's really very important to identify STIs if someone has got them, uh, before, ideally before they become pregnant, uh, and uh, certainly uh, before later stages of pregnancy and uh, labor. Some major STIs can be passed vertically from mother to baby, including uh, HIV, uh, syphilis and hepatitis B, all, all of which I'll talk about in a bit more detail uh, in a minute. Some of them can be passed on to the baby during the birth in the birth canal during labour, so that as the baby comes out, and they can cover the baby, get into uh, on the baby or into their eyes, uh, and cause significant issues uh, for the neo neonatal uh, baby when it comes out. So therefore, checking for STIs, remembering that these are common and treating them before or early on in pregnancy should be seen as normal good care. By definition, uh, a woman who is pregnant uh, is sexually active. Um, now, it may seem slightly odd that I put blood-borne infections alongside sexually transmitted infections, but the reason for doing that is that for the most important uh, blood-borne infections, the ones that are primarily or largely or partially tr transmitted uh, by blood-to-blood -blood contact, are also uh, sexually transmitted. So they're the same infection, but by different routes. Uh, and historically, medical practice was an important way that some of these were passed on. Classically, for example, using the same needle to inject several different people, or using an improperly cleaned or sterilized uh, knife or scalpel in surgery, or indeed in traditional medical practice, scarification and things like that, where the same object would be used on two different people, transmitting blood from one to the second. Relatively small amounts, but enough to pass on an infection. That's obviously gone right down. People now use, uh, in medical practice, almost exclusively reusable or very heavily sterilized um, uh, objects. The second medical way this was transmitted, uh, and uh, there were some very tragic examples of this, were blood products uh, before there was effective screening. And in particular, this was important for HIV, uh, for hepatitis B and hepatitis C. The third group, now again, that's been largely eliminated uh, by screening methods. The third group where infections are passed on blood to blood, so from one person's blood directly to the others, usually by, in, by a syringe, is people who are intravenous drug users who share needles and syringes. And this used to be very common practice in many places and still is very common practice in many parts of the world. Uh, and uh, this can pass on many major blood-borne infections, uh, including HIV, hepatitis B, and hepatitis C. There are others, but those are particularly important. And there are a variety of ways which these can be addressed. Uh, for example, using needle exchanges to encourage people always to use clean needles that keep a needle at least exclusive to themselves. I think it is worth uh, just pausing on the issue of blood transfusions and blood products, things like factor eight. These are an extraordinary gift from one person to another they usually don't know at all. People who donate blood are ext extremely altruistic and the health service uh, and uh, people's ability to have operations uh, and to recover from major traumas and things uh, depend on people being altruistic. So they can be life-saving. But 
if not properly uh, managed, they can also transmit infections. Uh, and the way that blood is managed between the person who donates it and the person who receives it is uh, it's, uh, it's done to minimize the chance that any infection can be passed on by this route. Uh, this includes things like saying, please don't give blood if you're uh, unwell at this moment, if you've got an infection, if you've got fever. Some travel destinations, so for example, if someone's gone to a place where there's malaria, malaria can be passed on blood to blood, mainly passed on, almost entirely passed on mosquito by via mosquitoes, but can be passed on by blood transfusions, rare, rarely. But the important uh, blood infections, uh, which can be passed on without careful management, uh, include HIV, hepatitis B, and C. And these have to be screened for. People are obviously are excluded if they know they've got disease, uh, but they also have to be screened for afterwards. And the infection rate by this route is now very low indeed. Now I'd like to move on to some of the important infections uh, that are, are worth thinking through and really mainly concentrating on the sexually transmitted infections. And the first of these I'd like to talk about is syphilis. Syphilis was a new disease in Europe, or we think it was probably a new disease in Europe, in the 1490s. A lot of uh, different views about where it came from. Did it come over the Columbus or so on? What certainly happened is it got spread following uh, the, the uh, siege of Naples, and it spread over a very small number of years in the 1490s and swept through Europe over a small number of years. Probably it was more severe early in its uh, waves uh, than subsequently, but it was, a, it was and indeed still remains a serious disease. It was really realized fairly early on in this new epidemic, this frightening epidemic that spread through Europe, that it was sexually transmitted. Uh, and as has happened very often, uh, this was therefore very quickly blamed on foreigners. Uh, in uh, England and the UK more widely, uh, it was known as the French disease, uh, elsewhere in Europe, it's known as the Italian or Spanish disease. Russia, it was known as the Polish disease and so on. But I think there's a theme emerging here. Uh, but uh, it was actually a disease that was passed on in every uh, continent, every, every uh, country in, in, in the continent. As a disease which uh, was both dangerous, caused serious illness, also caused visible scars that people you could see very often who'd had syphilis or been treated for it due to some of the uh, scarring it caused, uh, and the stigma that went with it, uh, particularly associated with the fact it was actually transmitted initially and the feeling that this was associated with kind of moral, uh, moral laxness, it was very widely feared. And it had a very profound effect uh, on the practice of medicine. Now, syphilis is, uh, although passed on sexually, is a disease of the whole body. Primary syphilis is something, uh, we're saying that it starts off with a chancre, which is a ulcer that's usually painless, lasting uh, three to six weeks. Trivial of no great importance. Um, normally in the genitals uh, can be uh, slightly different forms uh, in the throat or, or, or perianally. Secondary syphilis then follows after that and was a, causes a fever and a generalized rash various ulcers, people feeling fairly uh, unwell. And then for most people that passes, although initially it appeared that was really pretty serious for many people in the, uh, particularly in the first wave. And then you end up with tertiary syphilis, which can occur uh, 10 to 30 years later. And this can cause really serious problems throughout the body. And syphilis was known as the great mimic. It can cause problems in the brain, uh, with the nerves, with the eye, and this included uh, something called general paralysis of the, the insane, GPI, uh, and uh, this was something which caused both uh, mental uh, and uh, dementia problems, and dementia was a very significant long-term sequelae of syphilis. Uh, and for example, something called tabes dorsalis, really painful uh, uh, shooting pain in the limbs. Caused problems in the bones, in the joints, multiple kinds of things on the skins, lots of different kinds of skin rashes, also could cause inflammation of the heart and uh, swelling and inflammation of the great blood vessels uh, and of the liver. So this was a multi-system disease uh, and uh, extremely dangerous. 
over many years taking different forms at different stages of life. And on the right, I've illustrated this uh, with what is probably the first known illustration of uh, this treatment being uh, treated in 1498. Now, the initial treatment um, uh, was, uh, came from a variety of different sources, included herbal treatments, were, which were traditional in uh, Europe at the stage, uh, mercury, um, partly because it was thought to look slightly like uh, leprosy, which was treated this way, and various uh, woods and other uh, exotic um, uh, herbs, uh, for example, garcum, which came from a wood um, particularly imported from Latin America initially. Um, as a new disease, it wasn't, uh, wasn't fully described, or wasn't described at all, actually, in the ancient texts. And I think it's important to remember back to this period, much of traditional medicine was about reading the ancient texts, particularly the Greek texts of Hippocrates and Galen and others, uh, and uh, using their approach to medicine. And there was a real medical conservatism that meant that people uh, were not wishing to move away from that very, very uh, traditional form of medical practice. As a new disease, this allowed for a complete rethink of medicine. And some of the more radical thinkers on medicine at that point said that syphilis had got so entwined with all the other diseases that it led to a need for a complete rethink of medical theory and practice. And it, uh, for example, uh, made chemical drugs, which had been uh, much less respectable, things like sulfur and mercury, uh, semi-respectable, led to a new, several new branches of medicine. It allowed surgeons to start to practice much more widely than they previously had, because you used uh, pastes and oils uh, rather than just uh, internal drugs, which were the preserve of um, other medical practitioners, physicians. Led to quite a lot of building or conversion of new medical establishments, uh, some of the old leprosy hospitals were turned uh, into syphilis hospitals, from Lazar houses to lock hospitals. Wards were built, for example, just up the road from here, the daughter ward at St. Bartholomew's. And it had a very substantial effect on society, where it probably changed quite a lot of behaviours, and on literature. You won't get through many, or you, you certainly won't get through many restoration comedies, even many Shakespeare's plays, uh, without some indirect uh, reference to it. And it remained a really very serious disease, uh, both in numbers as well as in its medical impact, right up to the antibiotic era. And if you go down to uh, about 1919, uh, a Royal Commission uh, assessed that around 10% of the adult male population of London had it at that stage. Uh, in the US Army, uh, it was the second most common of illness leading to loss of duty. Uh, only uh, exceeded by the great flu pandemic, massive flu pandemic of 1819. It was one of the commonest causes of dementia, if you went back 120 years. And what changed that uh, were the introduction of the first really good uh, antibacterial drugs. First of all, uh, a moderately effective and relatively more dangerous arsenic-based drug, uh, Salvasan, uh, which uh, was introduced in 1910, and the thing which really transformed it uh, was, the, uh, was penicillin, which remains a mainstay of treatment of syphilis to this day, largely collapsed the epidemic in high-income countries. And if people were treated, potentially for other infections, which they might not even know they had syphilis, between their initial infection and their late complications, it could prevent those late complications. But to get rid of this as a major public health problem, there was also a need, and this was set up, to have a a whole medical service associated with finding people with cases and then finding their contacts and treating all of them. And this really led to a significant transformation of this major sexually transmitted infection. Now, the number, the way in which uh, cases were calculated uh, was uh, varied over time. But as you can see, there was uh, really substantial numbers of cases of syphilis diagnosed in England uh, up uh, until the 1950s, and then those numbers really collapsed. And this is the impact of penicillin. A little bit of a rise uh, subsequent to that, uh, then a fall away, probably driven by changes in sexual behavior around uh, the existence of HIV. And more recently, a bit of a comeback, uh, particularly uh, in England, uh, in men who have sex with men, but not exclusively. So that's syphilis, a really major disease, historically even more important, but still non-trivial. 
Then we move on to HIV AIDS. Now, between the 1980s and the 2020s, uh, HIV AIDS has been one of the most severe new threats to uh, health in the lifetime of most people who are watching this program. Over 36 million people have died to date, more will do so. And this has been a problem worldwide. So this is the last really uh, remarkably bad pandemic before we reached uh, COVID, uh, particularly true in Africa, but all around the world, uh, including here in the UK. And the photo on the right uh, is from a book about a ward I actually used to work on early in my career. The early years of HIV um, uh, are still being researched, but it, what, isn't, what is clear is that this jumped species. And it was originally um, one of a family of, or more than one of a family, of uh, simian viruses, um, uh, SIV, uh, and it crossed several times between uh, monkeys, probably among hunters, probably blood to blood actually, uh, to humans, leading to HIV, which was probably started in what was then Zaire, DR now DRC, from chimpanzees, and separately HIV-2, a slightly different version of it in West Africa. And probably these were circulating in humans from the 1920s, certainly before it was first picked up. It was first identified in the 1980s, and uh, in 1981, uh, gay men in California developed a very rare lung disease, uh, uh, something called PCP, uh, not normally seen otherwise in young uh, men uh, or young people. Uh, in New York, there was a whole cluster of people who had a, uh, again, a kind of cancer, which is extremely rare uh, in the general population called Kaposi's sarcoma. Uh, other groups were found around intravenous drug users in the USA. Uh, and simultaneously or near simultaneously, uh, cases started to be described of what's called slim disease in a variety of other forms uh, in Uganda and then elsewhere in Africa. So early 1980s, lots of people were diagnosed and they were being diagnosed not with HIV, which at that point had not been identified, but with AIDS, uh, a very serious disease, which at that point was for practical purposes, 100% fatal. Now, HIV, which is transmitted uh, sexually in the main, um, uh, it destroys key parts of the immune system, particularly the bits that are mediated by what's called the CD4 cells, but it takes many years to do that. And uh, on the right here, what we have uh, is the kind of schematic. Uh, in red uh, is the uh, cell count, where high is good and low is bad, uh, and in the blue, we have the virus. And what you initially have is a little bit of a dip, but then the uh, immune system recovers for a number of years, usually uh, eight or more uh, in most people, and then it begins to deteriorate over time. Uh, and as it deteriorates, people to get, begin to get more and more infections. Uh, and the, when they happen, they are much more in, uh, dangerous than they would have been in people who had an intact immune system. So the immune system, this, this key part of the immune system is essentially gradually eroded to uh, almost nothing. Things like TB, <clears throat> pneumococcal pneumonia, some salmonellas, various forms of meningitis, including fungal ones, several lung fungal infections of the lungs, of the brain, um, uh, in particular, the body more generally. And also, because the immune system scans the body for cancer and uh, helps to destroy, destroy cancers, uh, several cancers, or cancers driven by infections, such as Kaposi's sarcoma. So not having CD4 cells and the immune system that goes with them leads to multiple very serious diseases. And this is what some combinations of these is what constituted the group of syndromes called AIDS. Once this has started to circulate around the world in this pandemic, several different independent, essentially, epidemics that overlapped occurred uh, which, um, all of which led to HIV AIDS. There was a largely heterosexually driven, sexually transmitted infection uh, epidemic, particularly in Africa and especially Southern Africa, parts of Asia, parts of Latin America, but also Europe. Um, this was by far the largest, so the greatest majority in terms of numbers was this uh, large global heterosexual STI epidemic. <clears throat> 
And there were many children born to mothers who got HIV, so there was also a subsidiary epidemic uh, in children uh, who died uh, young. Then there was uh, simultaneously a significant epidemic uh, in men who had sex with men, uh, particularly in Europe and North America, but also globally. And there's obviously overlap between these two. There was an epidemic amongst people who were intravenous drug users because HIV is, in addition to being a sexually transmitted infection, it's by far its predominant means of transmission, also uh, a blood-to-blood -blood transmitted infection. And uh, tragically, in addition to these other, multiple other tragedies, uh, there were some blood products, such as uh, haemophilia sufferers, uh, where it got into the uh, supply. So this led to large numbers of people being infected, and initially, everybody who was infected uh, went on to die. The spread of this uh, was really quite rapid, uh, and these maps show the spread from top left to bottom right uh, over from the mid-80s uh, through to the end of the 1990s. And really over this entire period, and in, in Africa, the most affected continent, although as I say, it's in every continent, uh, it was really substantial. And over this period, there was, for practical purposes, 100% mortality. And the uh, numbers infected uh, were uh, dramatic. Uh, certainly at the point I was a uh, doctor in southern Africa and Malawi at that stage, uh, there was a situation where in many parts of southern Africa, uh, up to um, 30 or even 40 percent of people, of, of, of young adults, uh, were infected. Uh, for example, studies where I was, um, around 30 percent of pregnant women uh, in some studies had this. All of them would go on to die. So if you think about the impact of that on society, it was very, very profound. In the absence of medical countermeasures, drugs and vaccines, the initial response had to rely almost entirely on trying to change social behavior. Because of course, with the sexually transmitted infection, you don't have that ability to intervene except by changing behavior. And some of these posters are some of the ways in which people try to change overall behaviors. Some, I would say, more, more likely to be successful than others. Uh, and it was also important, as well as trying to change behaviors that led to people uh, reducing their risk, having fewer partners, uh, in, for example, uh, and uh, taking precautions, uh, also uh, to try and encourage people to understand that they could not catch this sexually transmitted infection from people from ordinary social contact. There was real fear that you might pick it up if you shared a workspace or a friendship group with someone in HIV. And of course, that wasn't true unless you actually were having a sexual relationship with them. Probably the most important early initiative was the promotion of condoms and other barrier methods of contraception. I'd just like to make a few points about this. There was really no very good evidence that abstinence-only campaigns had a major impact on HIV. That doesn't mean it didn't in individual cases, but in terms of slowing the epidemic down. On the flip side, there was no good evidence that condom promotion in any way increased sexual activity. No one was likely to have sexual behavior because they had a condom promoted to them uh, if, the, if they weren't intending to in the first place. And promoting condoms, and for some people, female condoms and diaphragms, reduced significantly the risk of HIV uh, and, importantly, other sexually transmitted infections, but importantly, also not to zero. An additional behavior which was found uh, to be important uh, slightly later in the epidemic uh, was circumcision, which also reduces the risk of HIV transmission. But the really big transformation uh, occurred with the advent of drugs to treat this terrible, uh, entirely fatal new disease. We've, had, we've got no vaccine for HIV yet that's available in widespread use. Uh, obviously, it is still being looked for. Uh, but uh, since the 1980s, many very effective drugs have been uh, introduced, the highly effective antiretrovirals, sometimes known as HART, uh, and they were really available uh, from the mid-1990s. Initially, they were moderately effective, had significant side effects, very expensive, complex to deal with, lots of drug resistance. But there have been steady improvements over time. And medicine always tends to advance not by sudden breakthroughs, but by incremental 
uh, improvements one on top of another. Uh, and this poster, I think, rather, illu rather well illustrates how uh, HIV has often moved from a situation where people had to take many drugs every day uh, to single drugs, and even most recently uh, to uh, injections they may be able to take for prolonged periods of time. So steadily improvement, uh, and the price dropped a lot, and for a variety of reasons, uh, some of which were to do with important legal challenges, uh, they became available to lower-income countries, where, in fact, the great majority of people who had HIV were living. As a result of these drugs, the life expectancy of HIV-infected people who are diagnosed early and treated uh, is basically the same as the non-infected, uh, but it is important that people are diagnosed early, and this is, cannot say this too often, early diagnosis is the key to managing sex potentially sexually transmitted infections. So the introduction of these drugs and then their spread worldwide has led to a really major reduction in deaths. And uh, what this chart shows uh, is deaths by um, age, and those in red uh, are people 15 to 49. So HIV was a disease, uh, still is a disease, that predominantly kills people in their young adulthood. And the introduction of the antiretrovirals has really brought that down. And in the countries where there are widespread antiretrovirals and have been for many years, uh, down to very close to nil. It'll never be completely nil. It also was found, and again, this took a little while to be proved, although it was, it was theorized from fairly early on, that if you treat people effectively, that reduces the chance that they will pass on uh, the disease. And the chance of someone with HIV who is well controlled on antiretrovirals passing on HIV to a partner is, as clo is close to, for practical purposes, nil. So highly effective. So if people are in stable relationships where one person's got HIV and the other has not, if the person on H with HIV uh, is well controlled, uh, the risks to the other person are absolutely minimal from that relationship at least. Additionally, um, for uh, people, uh, we now also have some people uh, will use pre-exposure prophylaxis where they take antiretroviral drugs uh, if they're going to have uh, high-risk sexual encounters with someone they're not in a stable relationship with in particular. And this reduces uh, transmission by up to 99%. So these are drugs being used to reduce transmission in, I in either direction. Despite that, the impact of HIV on societies has been massive. Uh, this is a schematic, a relatively old one, but I think it rather powerfully illustrates uh, what kinds of impacts uh, are likely to have happened. Uh, in the light blue bars is the age structure uh, it, that, that would have been in Botswana, one of the most heavily affected countries in the world, and in the dark blue is what the age structure was uh, as a result of this pandemic. And what you can see is that uh, the impact was really very profound. And if you think about what happens when you remove such large proportions of young adults of working age, parents, uh, and also uh, of children, uh, the, the, uh, the impacts were obviously tragic and extraordinarily widespread. There was also a significant epidemic in children uh, and in the early HIV epidemic, uh, between 50 and 45% of all children to HIV positive women uh, were infected. And of course, the women themselves would go on to die. And usually, if they had HIV, their uh, partner would have HIV. So the children who were not infected were left as orphans. So it had affected people in multiple ways. Most of those were infected actually in the birthing process uh, or during pregnancy. Uh, but pregnancy and breastfeeding were also important. So you could pass on at various stages in the early uh, life, but particularly in the birthing process. As a result of uh, using highly effective drugs, um, this is now less than 1%. Really, this has dropped away. In the UK, less than 0.5% transmission. The key thing being to identify it in pregnancy and treat it and, if necessary, take additional precautions at, around the birth. HIV, though, remains a major global threat. 
And this uh, is, the, uh, is broadly the map of the prevalence of HIV, how many people have it now, down on where it was, uh, but still a very significant global problem, and with HIV uh, in every continent. But there have been quite significant shifts within that pattern, uh, and this uh, is just showing uh, a, where HIV prevalence is, uh, and then the change over the period between 2000 and 2017. And you can see some areas, for example, in Africa, the rates have gone right down in green, and some areas, indeed, they've gone up. And this is to do with local practices and particularly how much treatment is available and early diagnosis. In high-income countries, HIV cases are now largely dropping because people are identified early and put on effective treatment, which means they're not likely to transmit. And deaths are very rare. So in the UK, life expectancy for people in H with HIV who are uh, identified early uh, is, for practical purposes, the same as for anyone else. And the rates of transmission are reducing because of uh, this um, uh, effective treatment uh, in all the different routes by which this is transmitted, uh, many of sex and men, heterosexually, uh, and others. So that's the two really major systemic diseases which are tra sexually transmitted. Now I'd like to move on to an important disease which causes cancer, and that's uh, human papillomavirus, HPV. This is exceptionally common, and it's, it's, tra it's sexually transmitted at an early age. So... Uh, young women tend to get it very early in their sexual lives, very often. Now, human papillomaviruses, there are a lot of them. Uh, some of them are largely so trivial that you don't get anything with them. Some of them cause warts, which are uh, not aesthetic and can cause a lot of psychological and sometimes relationship distress, but they're not dangerous. But there are some of them, uh, in particular HPV 16 and 18, but there are others, which cause cancers. And in particular, they tend to cause cervical cancer in women. Globally, around half a million people are affected um, uh, and uh, around 3,000 cases a year here in the UK. And to put a kind of ratio on it, roughly one in 140 UK females will be diagnosed with cervical cancer in their lifetime at the moment. But for reasons I'll come on to, this will change. Often, they will get their cancer early in life. So this is the age distribution on the right of this cancer, and because it's driven by a sexually transmitted infection, uh, like um, the other STIs, it's predominantly in young adults, very different from most cancers which are in much older age. It should by now really be almost 100% preventable by a combination of vaccination and screening, uh, particularly in um, the, the young cohorts coming through now. And the reason for that uh, is that screening has been really important and will remain important, but the thing which is really going to get on top of this is vaccination. The vaccination for girls in the UK against HPV 16 and 18, which are the key ones which have driven most of the UK cervical cancer, uh, was introduced in 2008. And since that time, the, uh, these particular uh, HPVs, the prevalence of them in the young Female, female, adult female population has really dropped away very substantially. Uh, and the vaccine effectiveness again of these uh, is uh, over 80%, not, not, uh, not 100, but certainly over 80%. And what this, these graphs show is that the, uh, some of the key HPVs that drive cancer have decreased, but the ones which actually were irrelevant to cancer have stayed the same. So it's not a change in sexual behavior, it's because uh, people are vaccinated. And what we know as of uh, this, this, just this last few months, this paper was published uh, very recently in The Lancet, uh, we now know that this is leading to a substantial reduction in cervical cancer risk in England. So very large study, th over 13 million uh, years of follow-up uh, uh, in, in people younger than age 30. And th these are the cohorts. Uh, and in those uh, who were um, uh, in the youngest uh, age when they were vaccinated, 12 to 13 years old, 87% reduction. Uh, slightly older age, 14 to 16, still a substantial reduction, very substantial reduction, 62%, but slightly lower. Once you get up to 16 to 18, 34% uh, reduction. What this shows is that st it's still worth doing, but actually this is a virus which people tend to acquire extraordinarily early uh, in many cases. 
So HPV vaccine, really important, and this is over time going to lead to a massive fall away in this important cancer of young women. And these vaccines are improving, so the number of HPVs they're up against uh, is getting wider. That will have a bigger effect on uh, some of the rarer HPVs causing cancer. Um, the safety data is getting stronger and stronger. These are very safe data, data, uh, vaccines. There's been an extension of the vaccine to boys. This helps both uh, boys who later uh, become men who have sex with men, but also will help to accelerate uh, the reduction in women, so it's got some big pluses. And in addition to cervical cancer, HPV sexually transmitted uh, can lead to vulval, penile, uh, anal cancers, and some mouth and throat cancers. So the vaccines will help against all of these. And additionally, the new vaccines are also protective against genital warts, which uh, cause, as I say, a lot of people distress. So multiple reasons to want people to get vaccinated as early an age as possible. The other two uh, infections which are particularly associated with cancers that are passed on sexually and bloodborne, and in both cases it's a bit of both, are um, uh, liver cancer due to hepatitis B and hepatitis C. In many developing countries, up to 90% of liver cancer, also known as hepatoma, uh, and up to 40% in some developed countries is due to one or both of these two viruses. And in some countries, hepatoma is the most common cancer that's there. Very high mortality. Once someone gets cancer, this is a scan of someone with a cancer in their liver. Uh, once they get it, the mortality, particularly in lower income settings, uh, is extremely high. Hepatitis B is both bloodborne and sexual. It's very common, actually. Um, easy to catch. So it's easier to actually catch hepatitis B in reality than it is, for example, HIV. WHO estimate that about 250 million people worldwide are infected with this. And the routes of transmission are interact with one another, but they're a combination of sexual and blood-to-blood. -blood. Um, in adults, it's sexually transmitted between uh, men and women, men and men, uh, women and women in theory, but men and men, men and women. Uh, intravenous, uh, intravenous drug use is a secondary important transmission route between adults. And in the UK, it's certainly an important part of the epidemiology. Then in many parts of the world, uh, particularly where it's not been treated, uh, there's vertical transmission, mother to child. So uh, a mother has hepatitis B, she then transmits it to her child, and then the child has, uh, has it. And then there's horizontal transmission between children by just scrapping around and uh, blood to blood uh, contact uh, in ordinary play. Most uh, children will then get it uh, before the age of five. So that is uh, the, the, the multiple routes by which, by a combination of blood uh, and sexual transmission, hepatitis B has become so common. There are some drugs to suppress it, but there's certainly no drug currently that is a cure. However, we do have highly effective vaccines for this. Uh, and it, it, we know from quite early uh, vaccine programs that hepatitis B can largely be got rid of by um, hepatitis B vaccination. And this leads, in due course after a number of years, to a reduction in hepatocellular carcinoma. So it's significantly reduced ca cancer incidence and mortality, first in uh, Taiwan, where it was uh, studied fairly early on. But now it's being rolled out in most countries in the world, including the UK, usually as a, in a combination vaccine with a number of other really serious diseases. It provides somewhere between 95% and 100% hepatitis B protection. The result of this is going to be a very significant reduction in this cancer, which is passed on by a combination of sexual and bloodborne routes. Hepatitis C is more bloodborne than sexual. The great majority now is acquired in adults. Originally, historically, by unsafe medical practice, including uh, blood, um, uh, uh, but now very much by intravenous drug use. But there's also some sp sexual spread as well, although that's uh, lower risk in this case, different from hepatitis B. Smaller, smaller number, uh, but uh, still a very significant uh, problem. No vaccine for hepatitis C, but in the last 10 years, we have uh, got now 
due to scientific work, several highly effective oral drugs which lead to up to 90% cure rates. So in a sense, the opposite way around to hepatitis B and more like HIV. Uh, in fact, you can, you can in fact cure people, which is different from the situation you find with HIV. So two important blood and, uh, and sexual infections driving cancer for which we have medical countermeasures. Switching on to the um, classical kind of inf uh, sexually transmitted infections, uh, I'd just like to go through some of the more common ones because these are things which are uh, very common in society. Uh, start off with gonorrhea. Uh, much less serious than HIV or untreated syphilis, but very unpleasant. Uh, people describe it like peeing with, peeing with razor blades um, uh, in people who've got symptoms, and sometimes can be serious. It can cause joint problems, a variety of other problems. It's particularly a problem if people have gonorrhea in pregnancy. It's quite common. There are about 35,000 cases a year in the UK. Uh, it's the second most commonly reported sexually transmitted infection. And I think two things just to highlight with it. The first of which is it is very concentrated where you find it. This is a map of the UK 2012 and 2017 just showing the progression. Uh, it is growing at the moment, but very highly concentrated in London and indeed very close to where I'm giving this lecture today. So it's particularly in urban settings. But the other really big problem we have with it is that there are now uh, highly multi-drug resistant uh, forms of gonorrhea, which ordinary antibiotic classical treatment of gonorrhea does not work for. And we are, in fact, potentially going to have to develop new antibiotics for this problem. So uh, there is a significant issue. It's getting bigger uh, as in terms of the numbers of cases, and it's getting more drug resistant. Important to highlight the complications if people still have gonorrhea at the point uh, they are, are in pregnancy, uh, at both before and, and during. Uh, if, people have, if women have gonorrhea, they can get pelvic inflammatory, inflammatory disease, and this can reduce fertility. In pregnancy, it can, it can cause a preventable miscarriage, could have been prevented by treatment, uh, and can lead to premature labor. And if children are born when a woman has, is infected, uh, they, can, they can get infections in particular and dangerously of their eyes. So uh, almost a third of babies born to infected mothers will get this uh, potentially blinding complication that needs to be treated very rapidly uh, uh, that you can see on the right. As I showed in the maps, the gonorrhea diagnoses are increasing in both men and women, both heterosexual and uh, men who have sex with men. Uh, but particularly uh, men who have sex with men, and it's been increasing over the last several years, arguably because people are taking fewer precautions as HIV has become less of a risk. Another disease uh, which got quite a lot of similarities symptomatically, though it's a very different disease um, in terms of the biology, uh, is chlamydia. It's a very common bacterial sexually transmitted infection. It's treatable, again, with antibiotics, Again, importantly, you've got to treat both partners at the same time. Over 70% of people who've got chlamydia notice no symptoms at all. And this means they might have two or more sexual relationships between the time they get infected and the time they actually meet uh, someone who then goes on to have symptoms. So they may be totally unaware of the fact they have it over many years. Those that do have symptoms uh, tend to notice pain on urination, uh, pain having sex or bleeding after it, bleeding between periods, and lower abdominal pain. And uh, any of these can be uh, pretty classical for chlamydia. Age tends to be younger, um, younger adults, uh, and it's more commonly diagnosed in, men, well, sorry, in women, but that's probably largely to do with um, the number of people who are symptomatic and seek uh, treatment. It is like gonorrhea, important to identify and treat chlamydia. Uh, in women, uh, it can again cause pelvic inflammatory disease and therefore have issues with infertility or ectopic pregnancies. And again, if infected in childbirth, it can cause problems in the eyes of the baby uh, or a pneumonia, because chlamydia is one of the causes of an atypical form of pneumonia. Men uh, can cause uh, inflammation, particularly around, and, uh, in, uh, around the tes testes, uh, and can affect fertility, although to a lesser extent. And men also, and much smaller number of women, men also can get a very unpleasant arthritis for weeks to months 
after the infection. Uh, this is an immune response, really. Uh, and that uh, can also cause them significant disability. So it's not a trivial disease uh, in those people who do get symptoms. And the third in this kind of group of diseases that have got some similarities uh, is a parasitic disease, uh, trichomonas, uh, on the right here. Again, very common, treatable, is a parasitic uh, sexually transmitted infection. Again, only about 30% of people who have it have symptoms. And of those that do, it's itching, inflammation, discharge, and pain on having sex. It can cause preterm birth in infected pregnant women, and like some of the others, because of the fact that someone's got an inflamed genital area, it increases the risk of HIV being spread. Relatively easy to treat uh, once it is being diagnosed. So with all of these, screening for them, if people have had high sex, high, higher risk or new sexual contact, uh, even if they don't have symptoms, because remembering lots of people don't have symptoms, uh, and uh, taking any symptoms, however trivial, seriously, because these are easy to treat uh, and important if untreated. Finally, in this group of uh, more classical sexually transmitted infections, um, uh, one which is, presents rather differently from the last three, herpes. Now, there are two um, main uh, forms of herpes simplex, herpes simplex virus 1, which is the cause of oral cold sores. It's not generally sexually transmitted, although it can be, can be transmitted orally to genitally. Uh, but uh, most people just have it on their lips. Uh, it's extremely common, and as anyone who's got it, and a lot of people who are watching this will have had uh, cold sores of the lips, uh, what you find is you have these, um, uh, these sort of bubbly uh, eruptions that occur on the lip, usually in the same place, and it breaks down to an ulcer, and then it goes away uh, because it's hiding in the nerves, and then it comes back, particularly if there's trauma or a variety of other things. But it, you acquire, people tend to acquire it in childhood, and then they'll have it lifelong. HSV2, which is the much more common sexual form, um, is very similar but it's in the genitals. Uh, estimated that there's just short of 500 million people have it uh, worldwide. Uh, the UK has got a significant rate, although lower than the USA, where a lot of the research has been done uh, on it. It's really similar to the cold sore in that you get an initial lesion, then it gets better, um, and then it can come back again multiple times during life. The, per the first time someone gets it, the primary infection can be very painful, uh, but often people have no symptoms or just have an, an itching and painful ulcer, which people really don't think a huge amount about. But then it can recur through life, sometimes with no symptoms at all, but with, when it does recur, someone is spreading um, the virus, potentially uh, infecting any partner, uh, sexual partner they have at that stage. And that's important because there's no cure for this and currently no vaccine, although drugs can uh, reduce both the frequency and the severity. And actually one of the biggest impacts that this uh, infection can have is on relationships because once someone's infected, often in early life, they know, they know that there is a reasonably high chance they may infect any subsequent sexual partner because it's not going to go away, can't treat it like the previous ones, uh, and it can come back uh, largely unknown or unprovoked uh, and infect a subsequent partner. So it is something which can have really quite important impacts on people's uh, romantic, um, emotional, sexual lives uh, and cause uh, relationship concerns. Finally, a slightly different one, and they have not gone through all the sexually transmitted infections. There are quite a few others, but um, uh, one that is uh, not in the, gen in the genitals themselves, uh, but around them, pubic lice, also known as crabs, for reasons that are really fairly obvious if you look at them uh, under a microscope, uh, as in this case. They're not dangerous. They don't spread any diseases. They just cause some itching, particularly if people are allergic to Lao's saliva. And they've evolved to live in pubic hair. That's there naturally where they live. Uh, they can occasionally live on other areas with sparse, thicker hair uh, on the body, um, occasionally eyebrows, but not scalp hair. So uh, head lice, nits and so on, are completely different. Uh, and if you see uh, head lice, they're not uh, sexually transmitted. Uh, it's not going to happen. Um, uh, you know, it doesn't go in, in either direction. <clears throat> 
they spread person to person. And of course, unlike uh, many of the other sexually transmitted infections, condoms are not going to stop them because they're not actually uh, on the genitals, they're in the hair around it. Uh, they're only able to live for a very short time off humans, so they tend to be human to human, and they're extremely easy to treat once diagnosed. If you get itching, uh, just think about it. Treatments are uh, really very straightforward. Finally, before I just round out on some of the epidemiology, uh, just worth noting that many important diseases have a rare but sometimes important additional sexual spread in addition to their main route of transmission. And I'll give two recent examples, Ebola and Zika. And what with both of these we have is a very prolonged persistence of the virus uh, for months, in some cases, in the male reproductive tract and the seminal fluid that comes from that, uh, from Ebola, which is a disease of touch, I'll come on to that later, and Zika, which is a vector-borne disease, which I talked about uh, in the first lecture in this series. And this can happen, uh, stay in the male genital tract for months after the man has recovered fully, uh, and if you test their blood, the virus has gone away completely. And they allow the infection, therefore, to be reintroduced into a society. If the epidemic's gone away, it can, they can reintroduce the epidemic long after the initial infection and, indeed, over some space. You can have a situation where someone, for example, picked up Zika in Brazil uh, but infected uh, their female partner uh, some weeks later in the USA. So it's a mechanism by which, even though it's a rare uh, transmission route for this particular virus, something can be uh, transmitted over time because it's over many months rather than over just a few days and over space. Finally, just a little bit on the epidemiology of sexually transmitted diseases uh, in the UK. They are highly clustered uh, in urban areas, particularly in the UK in London, uh, but also in the other big urban areas, and particularly, unsurprisingly, in areas where there are large numbers of young adults, uh, areas of higher education, early work, and so on. Uh, big uh, conurbations tend to be where young adults live. That, therefore, tends to be where sexually transmitted infections live. And what you see on the, uh, on the left here um, is a graph uh, where all the things colored red in terms of the uh, proportion of people infected, uh, all of those are in London. You can see a really heavy concentration of STIs uh, in London. In terms of what's happening over time, some are going away. In particular, um, uh, hepatitis B uh, and um, uh, anything associated with uh, HPV. Uh, importantly for cervical cancer, but increasingly warts. And what you can see, these green lines in uh, uh, men on the left and women on the right, is the green lines going down, and they will continue to go down because of vaccination programs. Some are, on the other hand, going up, and an important one uh, on these uh, is gonorrhea, which is increasing, particularly in men. Uh, and some are relatively low, but increasing slightly, uh, including syphilis. So over time, there are changes in the epidemiology of STIs. Really, it's the ones with which we have got vaccination or treatment where the rates are going down. Uh, the ones that depend on behaviors, uh, less so. So in summary, when we consider sexually transmitted and bloodborne infections, some of them are very common. Uh, some of them are, le are life-threatening. Um, early diagnosis and treatment is essential for all of them, whether serious or generally more trivial, but could be, for example, a risk to fertility or pregnancy. It's really important to destigmatize these and just to talk about them in an ordinary way. These are just an infection that is passed on by a route of infection, uh, which is uh, sexual. Um, HIV, syphilis, and hepatitis C have been transformed by treatment. The medical science on this has been absolutely transformational. And in the case of HPV, cervical cancer, and hepatitis B, uh, we've got vaccines, which will have a very major impact on those cancers over time. So there are some really good uh, forward movements uh, for these really serious uh, sexually transmitted infections. And looking, turning to um, uh, the blood-borne ones, uh, safe blood products, much safer medical practice means that side of transmission has really almost entirely gone away, at least in higher and middle-income countries. Uh, and initiatives such as needle exchanges uh, can be important uh, for those who are people who use intravenous drugs recreationally. Many things getting better, but sexually transmitted infections will always be with us. Thank you very much. <laughs>